So the next section we're going to look at is trigonometric substitution. So with trigonometric substitution, um, we are essentially trying to take integrals that have expressions similar to the ones that appear when we take derivatives of inverse trig functions and make substitutions in terms of trig functions that eliminate those algebraic expressions and get us back into something involving trig. Right? Um, and of course the idea is that you know, if, if we make a substitution like, um, like, let's say, x is equal to sine theta, which is sort of what we're going to do, well, that's really like saying, you know, theta is arc sine x. Um, so based on these three derivatives, there are sort of three patterns that we look for. Right? So we're going to look for the following patterns. Right? Um, if you see a squared minus x squared, reminiscent of, of arc sine, except, you know, there might not be a 1, it might be something else, right? What we do is we let x equal to a sine theta. And when we say x is equal to a sine theta, what we really mean here is we really mean that theta is arc sine of x over a. Um, most of the time this distinction doesn't matter, but occasionally we have to pay attention to domain issues, right, and realize, you know, that, that the inverse trig functions, they have carefully defined domains and ranges. So sometimes that's something you've got to pay attention to. Now, if x is equal to a sine theta, well then there's a couple of things that happen, right? We know that dx will be a cos theta d theta. Uh, but the other thing that happens is that, well, a squared minus x squared becomes a squared minus a squared sine squared theta. And if you factor out the a squared, right, then there's 1 minus sine squared left over, which is cos squared. So we get a squared cos squared theta, right? And so one of the reasons why these, these trig substitutions are useful is they do allow us to eliminate radicals because if I had something like this under a square root, right, making this substitution takes this and turns it into something that's a perfect square. So I can take that square root. Um, now, of course, you might be worried about absolute value, right, square root of cos squared. Um, that's where this comes in. If, um, if theta is defined as arc sine of x over a, uh, well, arc sine, remember, has a range from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, um, which is a range on which cosine is positive. So we can again guarantee that cos is going to be positive if we're making this substitution. So when we take the square root, we don't have to worry about, you know, um, absolute value. We, we do get the right sign, right? For arc 10, right, we're going to see a pattern that looks like a squared plus x squared. Okay, and so again, we kind of, if, if we have these in mind, right, these patterns suggest which trig function we should pick. If we, uh, if we have a squared plus x squared, we should try letting x equal to a tan theta, okay? And again, what we really mean here, what we really mean is that theta is arc tan of x over a, okay? Really, that's what we mean. And again, um, arc tan has a range from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, not including the endpoints, all right? Um, so if we do that, then dx is going to be a times secant squared theta d theta. And when I do a squared, plus x squared, well a squared plus x squared is now a squared plus a squared tan squared theta. Factor out the a squared, we have 1 plus tan squared theta. Um, 1 plus tan squared, we know that that's equal to secant squared. Okay, so we get a squared secant squared theta. Okay. So, 
Once again, we end up with a perfect square, which is why these substitutions are useful. Um, also, with a tangent substitution, what often happens is, you know, you might end up getting lucky and you find some cancellation depending on, on where things are sitting. Um, so that can be useful. All right. The last pattern, if I have x squared minus a squared, well, that's when I want to consider a secant substitution. Okay. Secant theta. Now, secant substitutions can get a little, you know, we, we saw some examples in the previous section that secant integrals aren't always the most pleasant creatures. But nonetheless, we can, we can attempt them. So dx would be a times secant theta tan theta. Uh, again, we might want to keep in mind here that what we really mean is that theta is um, arc secant x over a. And this time, some, sometimes this will run you into some issues with domains of definition. Um, if we're using the, the definition for arc secant um, that is given in the apex calculus textbook that results in that absolute value, um, right, then the range is defined to be in the first and second quadrants. Some books take the first and the third quadrants, and sometimes that has some effect on signs, but um, if necessary, we'll worry about it when, we, when it comes to it. Okay, and x squared minus a squared then becomes a squared secant squared theta minus a squared. Secant squared minus 1 is tan squared, so we get a squared tan squared theta. Um, here's why, this is one of the reasons why a lot of textbooks will choose um, secant to have a range in the first and third quadrants, because then we know that tan will be positive, right? Um, and, and so if we know that tan theta is positive, we don't have to worry about taking the square root of a square, right? It's just going to be tan, not necessarily absolute value of tan. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, we, we look for these patterns. We make the corresponding substitution. Once we make that substitution, the result is going to be some sort of trigonometric integral that we hope we know how to solve using the techniques from the previous section. Um, best thing to do is just work our way through a number of examples. So we're going to get to that right away.